Let us pray. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who, when you were given up to the will of your persecutors, suffered many torments when they took off the purple robe, which was stuck to your wounds, and put upon you your own clothes. Grant that after I have put off the clothing of this body, I may be clad with the robe of perfect charity, and that I may be adorned with your merit, and through your mercy be introduced as an adopted son into the heavenly inheritance. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who in the midst of reproach and injury bore your cross with excessive pain on your sacred and cut shoulders. Wearied and panting for breath, you toiled exceedingly under its heavy weight. Give me grace to take hold of the cross of self-denial with ardent devotion, and to imitate with the most fervent of charity the example of your virtues, and to follow you in humility even unto death. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who, when you were led from the city with two thieves, did not refuse to be pressed upon and thrust, hastened and to be afflicted in many ways. Draw me after you, that I may quickly follow. Grant that for your sake I may entirely deny, forsake, and go out of myself. Give me grace to think of you alone and to find no joy except in you, my Redeemer. Grant that I may love you alone and may return love for love. May I earnestly seek after you and live to you alone. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who, when bowed down by the weight of your cross, at length reached the place of punishment, where, offered e quite exhausted, they offered you wine mingled with gall. May you extinguish in me all gluttonous and carnal desire, giving me grace never to consent to any impure or unlawful pleasure. But may I take my food in moderation to the glory of your name and may hunger and thirst after you alone and find no pleasure or gladness except in you. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who was stripped before the gaze of all people on Mount Calvary, and the soreness of your wounds being increased by the removal of your clothing. You did not refuse to undergo for my sake the most dreadful pain. Grant that I may love the spirit of poverty, and never be disturbed by want or scarcity. Give me grace to bear patiently any difficulties or troubles in this life, for the glory of your name. Strip my heart of every vain fancy and affection, and grant me a holy intent with pious desires, renewing within me daily a most pure love for yourself. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who gave himself up to be extended naked upon the wood of the cross and the joints of your most holy limbs to be wrenched apart, most cruelly nailed and fastened thereto. Then for my sake you suffered your most delicate hands and feet to be most deeply wounded. Grant, O Lord, that I might remember with a faithful and grateful heart this your unspeakable charity when you did of your own accord stretch out your hands to be bored and your feet to be pierced through. O Lord, enlarge and extend my heart by a perfect love of you. Pierce it and fix it to yourself with the nail of your sweetest love and shut up within yourself alone all my senses, all my thoughts and all my affections. Amen. O Lord, open our lips, and our mouths shall sing your praise.
A reading from the Gospel according to St. John, chapter 16. Jesus said, After a little time you will see me no longer, and then again after a little time you will see me. Some of the disciples said to one another, What is this he is saying? After a little time you will see me no longer, and then again after a little time you will see me, and I am going to the Father. So they said again and again, What is this he is saying? A little time. His words are not clear to us. Jesus saw that they had this desire to put the question to him. So he said to them, Is this what you are questioning with one another? Why I said after a little time you will see me no longer, and then again after a little time you will see me. Truly, I say to you, you will be weeping and sorrowing, but the world will be glad. You will be sad, but your sorrow will be turned into joy. When a woman is about to give birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But after, when she has given, to the, given birth to the child, the pain is put from her mind by the joy that a man has come into the world. So you have sorrowed now, but I will see you again and your hearts will be glad, and no one will take away your joy. On that day you will put no questions to me. Truly I say to you, whatever request you make to the Father, he will give it to you in my name. Up to now you have made no request in my name. Do so, and it will be answered, that your hearts may be full of joy. All this I have said to you in veiled language, but the time is coming when I will no longer say things in veiled language, but will give you knowledge of the Father clearly. In that day you will make requests in my name, and I do not say that I will make prayer to the Father for you, for the Father himself gives his love to you, because you have given your love to me, and have had faith that I came from God. I came out from the Father, and have come into the world, Again I go away from the world and go to the Father. His disciples said, Now you are talking clearly and not in veiled language. Now we are certain that you have knowledge of all things and have no need for anyone to put questions to you. Through this we have faith that you came from God. Jesus answered, Have you faith now? See, a time is coming, yes, it is already here, when you will go away in all directions, every man to his house, and I will be by myself. But I am not by myself, because the Father is with me. I have said all these things to you, so that in me you may have peace. In the world you have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In today's passage, we come to the crux of what Jesus was trying to explain before he was to be taken away from the disciples. Just as an interesting aside, we read the opening verses, uh, opening words of verse 17, which John says, some of his disciples with perhaps the barely concealed suggestion that these did not include the author, John, who had already figured it out. But we digress. Seriously, though, Jesus was doing his best to reassure the disciples that, even if they were to think that everything was finished, that they were all going to be killed, nothing could be further from the truth. Jesus was not saying goodbye, but good night in the way a loving parent says that to his children, with the implicit promise of being reunited with them when the sun arises and the darkness is banished. It can be very hard indeed to be apart from family and loved ones, even for the shortest of periods, especially when you do not know how long it will be until you will be together again. The disciples had clearly understood that Jesus was going away, but they did not understand when, why, or for how long. 
This talk of their weeping and wailing turning to joy one day was confusing. Indeed, to be honest, if they had fully grasped what was going to happen over the next few days, perhaps we would have read of their rejoicing in the streets of Jerusalem, instead of gathering in fright, locked away in their upper room. The life of the Christian is one of great joy, but often tinged with a great sadness also, a sadness in respect of the state of the world we live in, the sin we see every day, and the stubborn pride of the friends and loved ones who refuse the love of Jesus. The joy of the world is transient and will be blown away on the wind, but the joy of the Christian will survive and give bloom to the eternal flower the glory of God's kingdom. Jesus was preparing the disciples for what was to come, although they had little idea of what it was they were talk he was talking about. We have the benefit of hindsight, and we know exactly what Jesus was talking of. His crucifixion, death, and his resurrection after three days, before he returned to the Father. He used the analogy of the pregnant woman who endures the sorrow and pain of labour and then the joy of the birth of her child. In the same way, the disciples would endure the sorrow of loss after the resurrection, after the crucifixion, to be replaced with the joy of the resurrection. We should find some reassurance that the uh, disciples had problems understanding this. For it reminds us that they were like us, mere humans and simple country people. With the possible exception of John, they had probably had little or no education other than what they had received in the synagogue, and they had no knowledge of the deep theology that we may have, or any other such matters. For Jesus to have taken them and turned them into the teachers of the faith, of the Acts of the Apostles, was surely a miracle. And if he could do so with them, he can do so with you. Jesus brings understanding to all of us. We should pray constantly that our eyes and our hearts are open to the truth and the miracles of the Spirit today. Before going much further, it is important to set the disciples' concern in its proper context. These are not stupid men, for they are certainly aware of the dangers that Jesus was facing, and also that by implication there is a share in that danger for each and every one of them by association. They are rattled by the thought that he is going to leave them, because they do not understand the meaning and implication of this for them. They have left their families and loved ones behind. Most of them appear to have left their livelihoods behind. The fishermen, possibly, could have gone back to their fishing boats, and after a while it is possible that they could have had a more normal life. But what of Matthew? There was nothing left for him waiting in Galilee. It is quite possible that some of the others were in similar positions. We do not know whether, what their occupations had been. They had joined Jesus in the thought that there was a lifetime of work ahead for them. They were, of course, correct in this, but not quite in the way that they had imagined. Jesus left us a number of promises. The first promise says, what was ever we will be asked for in the name of Jesus will be granted. This is a restatement of the promise already given several times in this chapter. The second promise was that the things which seemed mysterious and could not be understood will shortly be made clear. When the Spirit comes upon them, they will understand everything and be able to teach on all things in complete confidence. The third promise was that all the disciples and by extension all believers will have a direct line to God the Father because he himself loves you because you have loved me. It will not be necessary to ask Jesus to ask the Father on our behalf. 
God the Father wants to hear from us, the very ones he loves so very much. Even so, sometimes we just cannot grasp things. It doesn't matter how many times things are explained to us, it just does not sink in, it does not register. I'm quite sure we can remember things from when we were at school that we found particularly difficult. I know I can, and it was something that caused me a great deal of difficulty in my time. The problem was that it was just a subject that was too abstract. Because once I had left school and had to deal with the same thing in the real world, suddenly it became amazingly simple. The disciples found themselves in a similar situation. Jesus had spent no less than the first 28 verses of this chapter of John explaining things to them, and yet they still failed to understand. Finally, in verse 29, the message is understood. Not that Jesus had explained it in particularly different terms, but the time had come for them to understand. We have already considered on other occasions how it is never possible for us to understand all the issues of heaven while we are here on the earth. The great mystery is that only those in heaven can fully understand and appreciate. Sometimes the Spirit enables us to have an insight into some of these mysteries, but uh, they are just that, mere insights. Today it is not that we read of some new explanation by Jesus, but that the minds of the disciples were opened just a crack, just sufficiently for them to be able to grasp the message he was sharing with them. The passage then continued with a prophecy which was to come true so very shortly afterwards. Jesus was about to be arrested and the disciples would run away returning to their lodgings, leaving their master alone to face his persecutors, his humiliation and his death. Yes, it is very easy for us to stand up for something when we are part of a crowd. But when the going gets tough, it is still easier to put our heads down and wait for things to calm down. As the disciples were about to discover, with the Holy Spirit in our hearts, it is impossible to be silent or seek safety when our love for Jesus is challenged. Let us pray. Almighty God, give us grace that we may cast away the works of darkness and put on us the armour of light. Now in this time of mortal life, in which your Son Jesus Christ came to visit us in great humility, that in the last day, when he shall come again in his glorious majesty, to judge both the living and the dead, we may rise to the life immortal. Through him who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God now and for ever. Amen.